Most of the time, gaming's pretty straightforward. You got a goal, you go for it. You overcome, you defeat, you win. Sometimes it's a little more bizarre though. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, the 10 weirdest in-game scenes that we can't really explain. I was sitting here trying to think of something to say at the beginning of this to prepare you for it, and the fact is, there's really no way. Sometimes game developers just get weird. That's the best I can I can put it. So let's not delay anymore. Starting at number 10, and this one's gonna hit you hard, uh, the Honey Bee Inn. You know, from Final Fantasy VII. Before you bum rush the Shinra Tower and had to get the hell out of Midgar, you have to get through Wall Market. Now this area is one of the most dense and interesting towns in the entire game. There's a bunch of stores, some side quests, and even some mini games to play around with. But the thing everyone really remembers is, is the Honey Bee Inn. Now Wall Market is kind of already a bit of a seedy place, but the Honey Bee Inn is so seedy that it's off in its own little corner, its own separate screen. It's a hotel, it's got four possible rooms to enter, all of them are uh, awkward is probably the best word, but by far the most infamous is the group room. You go in, and there's just this whole crowd of ridiculously stereotypical muscle men that barrel into the room. Cloud literally has to jump out of the way so they can fit in. Then the camera pans up. All these guys get up in Cloud's business, and the camera pans over to all of them sitting in a hot tub and a sauna together in a cartoonishly awkward way. Once this scene is done, the main muscle man, the head honcho of these guys, gives you a memento of your time together, uh, some bikini briefs. Now, that's just things going according to plan, of course. Uh, Cloud intends to use the bikini briefs as part of his disguise to rescue Tifa from Don Cornero's mansion. Long story. Like I said, the place is quite seedy, though, so you can imagine why she is there. The thing that's happening to Tifa is actually, like, actively harmful to Tifa, though, and she's using it. Whereas, the thing you did was the most awkward thing in the world. Uh, so you could acquire some bikini briefs to cross-dress, which is fine. Not going after trying some different clothes on. Nothing wrong with cross-dressing, but uh, the path to it, <laughs> let's just say. It's the part of the game where that sort of dead expression, the main in-world model of Cloud has, makes the most sense. And number nine is the Sengoku family headquarters from Yakuza Kiwami 2. The Sengoku family headquarters situated directly under the Osaka castle. Uh, it also happens to be another larger gold-plated castle that rises up out of the ground. Uh, the security measures include ninjas, pitfalls, samurai, and two actual tigers for a boss fight. So, uh, yeah, not exactly too friendly to an endangered species. Um, <sighs> This sequence is so jarringly out of place in an otherwise, and yes, I understand that this is also a, a slightly relative statement, fairly down-to-earth crime drama. Yes, there's stuff in, in Yakuza that is so far away from down-to-earth, but like on average, okay? And, and just nothing is ever made of this at all. Like we've already talked about the insane Be My Baby submission in Yakuza Kiwami 2, which is weird, don't get me wrong, but if you want to talk about bafflingly weird in game scenes, it doesn't get much crazy crazier than Sengoku headquarters. In fact, it might actually be the most ridiculous thing in the entire series, and that is saying a lot. You arrive at the place in chapter 12 on a mission to rescue your adopted daughter, and for the most part, this game's been pretty serious up to this point. Yakuza 2 and Kiwami, the remake, were kind of one of the most serious and violent games in the series, but that just stops here, because this place is, I mean, it's a Yakuza headquarters that's an entire castle, but then out of nowhere, the castle splits in two and a bigger golden castle, a castle made of gold, rises up out of the ground in its place. That is happening in a Yakuza game, which usually takes place in a small area called Kamurocho, which is a fictionalized Kabukicho. I think I'm saying that right, I don't know. What follows is the most ridiculous level in the entire series. It's complete nonsense, and it comes out of nowhere, and it's never mentioned again.
And number eight is Emil's Mansion Basement in Near Replicant. Uh, Near was already a weird game, right? But the moment it really starts to get out of control is when you unlock Emil's Basement. First time through the mansion's weird enough, right? The black and white visuals are spooky. It's got this kind of haunted ambiance to it. But when you return, they go from regular run-of-the-mill weird to just eyeball-searing bafflement, for lack of a... If that's, is that a real word? It doesn't matter. It described it correctly. After opening up the secret passage that leads underground, you find this surprisingly modern-looking bunker. And for some reason, you explore it in a Diablo-style top-down three-quarter view. Nothing else quite like this in the story to this point, but it's just the start of the strangeness. At the end, you find this thing, number six, a man-made super weapon that's also Emil's sister. Why it looks like a bobble-headed skeleton, your guess is as good as mine. It fights like an insane monster, not some kind of magic weapon, and when you finally kill it, it fuses with Emil and creates the form he's more famous for. I, I didn't know about any of this stuff or what Emil's true form was, so this whole sequence was really nuts. Welcome back, Emil. You've been through a lot. But my... My body... I can't stand to be with you when I look like this. I mean, how many games transform one of the main characters into whatever this is supposed to be? And it's not temporary, it's permanent. That's just what he looks like now. It's weird. And number seven is a Billy Idol concert in Alex 2. Yeah, I said that. This is nonsense. Uh, and it speaks for itself. It's exactly what it sounds like. Alex 2 is already pretty strange from the start. Settings basically post-apocalyptic, but with some fantasy and sci-fi thrown in. One of the factions are a bunch of fantasy guys who use magic. They're literally called the Berserkers. Another faction uses high-tech weapons with mechs and plasma guns. It's that type of game. Second one was a little better than the first, in my opinion. I like that it leaned more into the bizarre. I'm not a big fan of the first, actually. Besides the point. And in video game terms, that stuff is all pretty standard. Uh, but I'll tell you what's not standard. It's a Billy Idol concert that gets triggered when you go by a stage. And no, it's not a cover of Billy Idol. It's literally Billy Idol. This thing's set supposedly way into the future. Don't know why he's there. But you walk in, there's a full concert. I do have to say they didn't do Billy any favors here. Like, look him up performing in recent years. He is, I mean, he's older, but he's not basically asleep on stage and then they just disappear so it's like why is it there i don't i don't know perhaps one of the developers really likes billy idol because i cannot think of any other real explanation for this and number six the cutscene from zelda twilight princess um twilight princess is just a weird game it's up there with majora's mask is one of the strangest of the zelda games in terms of gameplay it's like very traditional in terms of the Zelda series, but there's some pretty weird cutscenes, and I don't know why they're like this. The big one everyone remembers is when you meet the Spirit of Light before the Lake Bed Temple. They tell you about a forbidden power and the creation of the land of Hyrule, and things take a turn for the weird almost immediately, where in the vision, Ilya, the Spirit of Light, suddenly has a knife and tries to kill Link, but he kills her, and then he gets these weird white eyes, and for some reason, three Shadow Links rise up out of the ground. They all hold up their hands, Link turns into dust, then the camera pans back and shows the Link is not one of them. I think. I I'm not 100% sure. The vision ends with a close-up of Link's face like he's screaming in terror, so yeah, weird. The whole thing is meant to be a visual representation of the story the spirit's telling, but I don't, I don't, it's so much more weird and twisted than what people expect from Zelda games. At number five is Guy Savage in Metal Gear Solid 3. After getting captured near the end of MGS3, you'd expect Snake to start having some weird dreams. Uh, what I didn't expect is that he'd dream up an entirely different game, though. For some reason, instead of having a dream related to, you know, the game, Snake dreams about being a kind of warrior dude, hacking and slashing these zombie policemen. It's set in a warehouse area with destructible walls, and all you can do is attack enemies until the main guy transforms. Whole thing lasts for about five minutes, but uh, just looking at it, you can tell it's a completely different game that was apparently being developed at the time and was canceled, and maybe they used it here. I, I really just don't know. The whole thing's so baffling because it clearly took some effort to put in and has nothing to do with the game. It doesn't even seem to be set in the same universe. I mean, MGS3 is a 1960s Cold War espionage game, while this looks some kind of supernatural modern-day near-future slasher thing. Genuinely have absolutely nothing in common.
And number four is Andre from Shadow Hearts Covenant. For a game at least partially meant to evoke the horrors of World War I, Shadow Hearts Covenant is uh, pretty goofy when it wants to be. This is a game where you get both a vampire wrestler and Geppetto as part of your team. So yeah, it's weird. But there are a few moments that are really out there, even for this game. Like this one where your team gets lured out into a forest, only for your friend to pull a giant lever and reveal Andre, a giant cat. Even in a game filled with bizarre, grotesque monsters, having to find an overgrown purple cat, a little extreme. The whole scene's really dumb, too. For some reason, it becomes a full-blown comedy with Yuri blurting out, that's one big pussy. That is one giant pussy. And yes, it's referring to a cat, so don't even try to act like we're out of line for quoting him. Just compare this scene to the opening cutscene for a near terminal case of mood whiplash. There's a lot of goofy scenes in this game, but this is so weird. I don't know why it's there. And number three are the negotiations from Armed and Dangerous. Being a comedy game, you're gonna expect some out there stuff, but Armed and Dangerous, that, that finds a way to surprise you. The whole sequence needs to be seen to be believed. It's just rapid fire right from the start. Uh, it opens with heroes trying to negotiate with the king's messenger, who is comically hard of hearing, and climaxes with the supposed good guys blowing off their hostage's foot, mistakenly castrating him, and then reattaching the foot. I'm sure the foot is what he wanted reattached in this situation. Actually, he probably forgot about that foot pretty quick with the castration aspect of things. Take your scalpel and make a small circumcision. Don't you mean inci- Don't argue! We don't have time! What? What, what, what is it? They're circumcising him. This one has so much going on, it's, it's actually kind of hard to follow. The jokes are really rapid fire and very ridiculous. Uh, basically, any scene for Armed and Dangerous could count for a list like this, but this is probably the one that works the best, our favorite at least, and for good reason. And number two is the death of Travis Touchdown from No More Heroes 3. If you want a dose of pure uncut suit of 51 pumped directly in your veins, No More Heroes 3 is the game to do it. In game design terms, it's kind of a mess, but there are so many bizarre and head-scratching scenes in it, it's, it's hard not to love. Near the end of the game, Travis Touchdown finally gets a rematch against his brother, and the final boss of the first No More Heroes, Henry Cooldown. Without context, the whole encounter's bizarre, but in context, it's actually more confusing. Henry's character is suddenly different from the last two games. Instead of being the blue Oni to Travis's red Oni, he's become a zombie cultist with magic powers, and he wants to single-mindedly destroy his brother. I mean, in the last game, these guys were allies. What happened? At the end of the battle, Travis cuts his brother in half, who somehow still keeps trying to kill him even though he's a torso. Travis leaves, camera zooms in on a window like a horror movie shot, revealing that Henry is still alive somehow. Then he kills Travis while he's on the toilet, which somehow leads to Travis going into the Deathman game and asking Deathman to bring him back to life, which he does. Then Travis bursts out of a coffin and ex inexplicably meets his idol, Takeshi Mike, who is the actual Takeshi Mike. I've got a request. What is it? I'd be happy to do whatever I can. Could you film a live action version of No More Heroes? There is no semblance of logic at this point. And finally, at number one is Wedding Crashers from Saga Frontier. You want weird game scenes we can't explain? This is not something anybody can explain. The guys from the game can't explain it. Saga Frontier is a unique RPG uh, where instead of just telling one story, you actually pick from several different characters who all have different stories. Amelia's story starts off normal enough. She's hunting down the man who killed her husband so she can find out the truth and get revenge. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Seems things are going in that direction and then end up with a final confrontation with the villain Joker. And then then things take a turn for the baffling. Out of nowhere, the heroes decide to put on a fake wedding for Amelia so she'll get over her husband, which it seems emotionally incorrect to me. And completely out of nowhere, someone says, watch out, something's coming from above. And then this boss named Diva appears. There's no foreshadowing, no explanation. It's just the final boss because her store needed a final boss. The Saga Frontier wiki says this thing is under Joker's control, uh, but there's not really any evidence for this because nothing in the game implies that it is the case at all. RPGs tend to have final bosses that come out of nowhere, but not this out of nowhere. It's, it's random. It's totally random. It's a dramatic climax 
to Amelia's story that seems like it's going to culminate with a fake wedding and then ends with this boss fight. I don't even know what to take from it. It's insane. It makes no sense. What do you think? Leave us a comment. Let us know. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click that button. And also, don't forget to enable notifications. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.